These are the top four quarterbacks for week 10 of fantasy football. The potential quarterback ones overall, according to Hayden Winks' rankings, you can find those in the description down below. Josh Allen against the Denver Broncos. Joe Burrow against the Houston Texans. Dak Prescott at home against the New York Giants. And Lamar Jackson against the Cleveland Browns. All four of these guys are at home, Hayden. They are at home. They are also in decent matchups, except for Lamar Jackson, of course. The top three quarterbacks are all projected for about 27 points. They are kind of outliers in projected points. By the way, it's another very low-scoring week across yeah. the NFL, according to the betting markets. And then, of course, with Lamar Jackson, there's a ton of notes to go over. But he's been playing so well, and he has the rushing upside that these other quarterbacks don't necessarily all have. So even though the team total is lower, the worst game environment, blah, 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 blah. Got to give him some respect. As the people know, we kind of use this show as a opportunity to also talk about these offenses in general, the matchups mm -hmm. in general, and just not about fancy points for each of these quarterbacks. Right. Um, and I want to talk about these four for a little bit because, Sweet. you know, they're the best and they've got great matchups in terms of just fun. Uh, Josh Allen, rushing touchdown in six of his past seven games. This is maybe a reason why James Cook, mm -hmm. Latavius Murray might not be getting home for you. Um, and then the Broncos are allowing a league high 136 rating facing play action. So Ooh. let's see if Ken Dorsey unleashes the play action playbook in this game. Uh, for your guy, Joe Burrow, I mean, seven point favorites, 27 and a half total in this game. These are the two teams with the lowest turnover rates in the NFL. And we know that Joe Burrow has thrown multiple touchdown passes in uh, four straight games. And since, you know, the calf injury has improved. He's using play action on 31.6% of his dropbacks in the past two weeks uh, compared to about half of that, 18% prior to that too. And he's been 20 of 24 yeah. in those weeks of off play action as well. Those are awesome notes. I had just that he's averaging 283 passing yards in these last four games. Hopefully, Jamar Chase and T. Higgins are back. Usually, this is kind of just a veteran's day off, but they haven't practiced much or at all this week. So we'll have to update this on Friday. And then my other note is, the Texans now have the offense to keep up. You know, like this is the second highest game total of the week as well, just because CJ Stroud's playing lights out. Kind of. They did last week, um, not the week before. We'll get into CJ Stroud and this Texans offense here in a moment. I do want to bring in the Bengals, though, because like this Jamar Chase, T. Higgins stuff, as you just mentioned, we got news that they aren't practicing, but then Jamar Chase did go out there on the practice field with the jersey and was stretching out. So I'm with you. Like to me, these guys could miss practices and. Right still show up and we'll find all that out obviously later on this week. And I brought up that play action rate because the Texans are actually allowing 75% completion rate against them and 10 yards per pass attempt on off play action passes this year. The Texans, I don't think you're getting Derek Stingley back, but at least he's eligible to come off. He's a first round corner. Yeah. Uh, honestly, very impressive. The Texans have been without like first and second round picks for this, both of these last couple draft classes and still are playing pretty, pretty they solid. They can coach. They yep. can coach. Okay, Lamar Jackson is your quarterback four, so that means first we'll talk about Dak against this Giants team. Um, we mentioned it when discussing Tony Pollard, where they're going to put up a bunch of points. Yes. You know, It's just who are those points going to be attributed to? Uh, I know people get a bit nervous in game environments like this when the Giants aren't going to score anything, and that means... You know, this Cowboys offense probably has to take the pedal off the floor like halfway through the third quarter, if that. To me, we are more likely to get offensive touchdowns than defensive touchdowns. And if a team is leading by that many points, then the offense has done enough to put the 27 and a half points that they're projected to do on the board already. And I believe that Dak Prescott and Tony Pollard will have a hand in doing that. I agree with you. There is some evidence that this Giants team is so bad, though, that <laughs> it actually is hurting fantasy quarterbacks. They have allowed the fourth fewest fantasy points to quarterbacks this year. So that's not good for Dak Prescott. But if you really look into the matchup, the Giants play man coverage at the highest rate in the NFL, according to Sports Info Solutions and my own eyeballs watching this defense. Dak Prescott is number one in success rate number one in EPA yeah. and second in yards per attempt against these man coverage defenses. So he should be able to light this thing up. I like how they're using CD lamb as well. So there, there is risk that this game gets so out of control that it's just going to be really slow and sloppy, but we can also see three touchdowns in the first two quarters. 
And I think we have to be playing for the upside because quite frankly, looking around the league for fantasy quarterbacks, it's not very great to me right now. Well, let's talk about Lamar then because these are the two best defenses in the league. And it's pretty amazing when you get a game like this and also teams in the same division. And also they've already played each other. Like back in week four, Lamar Jackson against the same defense was the quarterback three overall, 28 points in that game. And to me, that was the start of seeing this Browns defense having a bit of an issue against mobile quarterbacks that can hold into the football for like that extra second or that extra millisecond. We had this Lamar game and then to a much lesser degree, the Gardner Minshew game, but he gave them fits in that one. So Lamar, when just putting your eyeballs on that previous game against the Browns, again, he was able to either in the pocket or escape the pocket, freeze defenses, hold on to it, and then find open receivers down the field. And I'm excited to see if he can do it again. I think that this Browns unit is very good, though. And there was one thing that was kind of caught my eye. The game where they played against each other was also the Ravens lowest neutral pass rate game of the season. And that's kind of what's been happening uh, just in general against this Browns defense. They're basically allowing like the fewest amount of targets in the league. And then once you do throw the ball against the Browns, they're actually forcing the ball to the sideline the most as well. Historically, Lamar Jackson likes to throw it over the middle because he's got this guy named Mark Andrews right. who's pretty solid. So it was such a good game last week that I still wanted to give the respect to Lamar Jackson. But what the Browns are doing on defense to me is sticky, really solid play defensive player of the year on top of that number one corners to eliminate these Ravens really bad corners. So we'll have to see Lamar's gonna have to put this team on his back. And I don't think that the Deshaun Watson Browns on the other side of the ball are going to be able to move the ball against this Ravens defense, especially without their offensive tackles. So this game total is way, way, way lower than the first three quarterbacks. Totally. Um, And Baltimore has 17 rushing touchdowns a season uh, compared to just 10 through the air. So Gus bus. I know. Yeah, I know people are so frustrated after last week when this team puts up so many points and, you know, Lamar Jackson gets like eight in the end of it. Okay. We'll kick off tier two with Justin Herbert. This against the Detroit Lions, another really fun matchup. 23 implied points here, Hayden. Um, We know that you attack the Lions defense down the field because these injured cornerbacks and some of their safety groups. But do the Chargers right now have the wide receivers to do that outside of Keenan Allen? They really don't. This is injured units versus injured units. You said the secondary, Josh Palmer, to me, is a big deal. Obviously, Mike Williams was their number one field stretcher. They just don't have any vertical elements. The Quinton Johnson reps last week were no good. So brutal. No good. (laughs) The Jalen Guyton reps, also no good. So Justin Herbert's going to have to dink and dunk his way through the field, or somebody's going to have to step up and make a play. And quite frankly, Justin Herbert hasn't been very good. So when I went into the actual matchups here, I looked at it. The Lions are playing the second highest rate of middle of the field open coverages, which means two high shells at the top. They play a lot of zone defense underneath. They rush with four because they think they can get Aiden Hutchinson home. Well, against those type of looks, Justin Herbert is 23rd in success rate. So it's been tough. I still think that this game environment has a chance to shoot out because both offenses, when they're playing well, is very good. But there's a reason why I have Herbert in the tier below here, just because... I think he's still missing the center, Corey Lindsley. Definitely the vertical pass element is missing. And we've seen this neutral pass rate fluctuate from up and down just because yeah. Kellen Moore is trying to figure out what the hell his offense is good at. And we know that he's going to always play against the opposing defense as well. Yeah, and I think Jack Campbell is still learning on the job quite a bit, but we've seen him at the linebacker group like make some really unbelievable pass breakups because he is so athletic at mm-hmm. the second level. Yeah, I mean... When you are two and a half point home underdogs here, and I don't know how much of a narrative this is, but you know the Lions are coming off a bye week and can be preparing for this for extra time. Right. At least Jared Goff is on the road, but he's how much on the road? In is the dome. Because he and he, he used to play here. Yeah, he probably still has a home in Los Angeles. Exactly. So the tiny hands narrative. It's warm out right now. It's like about seventy five degrees. Yeah, Santa Ana winds. It's nice and nice and pretty out here. Okay. Speaking of Jared Goff. He's your quarterback six. This is, again, against this Chargers defense. Jared Goff before that bye week. Quarterback three, quarterback three, quarterback eight this season, but also four weeks of quarterback 18 or lower. So, like, we've had some peak games. Then we've had some Dave Montgomery and Jameer Gibbs Mm -hmm. rushing games that, you know, then make the quarterback not score a bunch of points. Um, But Tua, Patrick Mahomes, Dak Prescott, Kirk Cousins have all 
scored top five quarterback status against this Chargers defense. Can he make it fifth on that list? I think he's got a chance to because the Chargers are dead last against fantasy quarterbacks, like you mentioned. But the Chargers defensive line is actually stepping up now that Bosa's healthy. They're getting a USC alum, a rookie out there. Tule? To, yeah, Tule. To, to I mean, again, you guys have defenders who pop up as mid-round picks mm -hmm. every single year, and your defense freaking sucks. Hey, it's we're, we're, we've removed Alex Grinch. Things are things are looking up. Now. Oh, at, at least you get to maximize the Caleb Williams window. Exactly. With, with a new defense. You don't think that? I, I don't even know who's going to be quarterbacking for USC next year. <laughs> I'm not concerned. I think Cliff King or not Cliff King. Well, actually, Cliff Kingsbury as well. But Lincoln Riley's going to be able to recruit somebody over there. Anyways, Jared Goff. The downside risk, obviously, David Montgomery stealing goal line opportunities is a risk. But at the same time, the Lions have the fourth highest. Uh, projected total in this, and it's actually like there's a pretty steep decline from four down to five and six and beyond that. So right. been up and down. We're basically flipping coins for touchdowns. I don't think that the I think the Lions are gonna be able to get plenty of yardage against this Chargers defense. You know, and the secondary to me is a total mess. It's not the defensive line anymore. It's right. actually not even the run defense anymore. It's the secondary. The secondary is a total mess, man. Brandon Staley, what you doing, man? This is what your specialty is supposed to be yeah. for the last three seasons. Yeah. Well, J.C. Jackson not being there and uh, Derwin James not being himself and the linebackers. Well, Chargers use a ton of zone coverage and yeah. against zone coverage. Jared Goff has a hundred passer rating second in the NFL and 11 of his 12 touchdown passes have come against zone coverage. Okay. Okay. So that's why he's my quarterback six. This is why Geno Smith. This is a big deal. Is your quarterback seven. I'm starting him in a league. Hayden. We always talk about it that, like, hey, just because Geno Smith has, you know, one top 12 scoring week on the season, maybe we appear in week 10 and he can get another one. And it's because this matchup is perfect for it. Again, 26 implied points. They're at home. Six and a half point favorites. The formula has never let us down. And it shouldn't here with Geno Smith as a top seven quarterback, which I don't think he's done outside of one time this season. It's been a total mess for Seattle. I looked at the negative play rate inside the red zone and the Seahawks are right up there with the Titans in Jacksonville, who've just been really struggling once they get into the red area. I don't think that this team would be like necessarily a team that should struggle in the red zone. I think Geno Smith is a good enough quarterback. They have DK Metcalf, especially against this Washington center secondary. That's really petite. And I think this travels back to last year too, if I'm not mistaken, sure. because I think the Seahawks led the NFL in touchdowns outside of the red zone last season. They, they did. Cause that's, I think that's because they're so explosive and they can score right. long touchdowns as well, but it's something that the Seahawks definitely need to fix. I do think they are going to be able to fix this. One of the problems with Geno Smith recently has been, the right tackle play has been horrific because they're dealing with backups and 41 year old right tackles. Well, commanders don't have chase young and Montez sweat at this point. So if this ranking feels ridiculous, I hear you. Like he's been very bad this season. There are also not many other great quarterbacks down a tier. And if you think I'm crazy, how about you go over to a friendly sports book and take a, a, a an under on the team total. Cause they're at 26, man. Like 26. Some, something's something's, not lining up you either have to think that the betting markets are way off or geno smith's a quarterback one um i'm gonna ride with the betting markets yeah and look patrick mahomes to uh J jalen hurts all on bye weeks you know you have the likes of deshaun watson that will be further down this list mm -hmm. geno smith based on his totals this year should be on your waiver wire should be out there in free agency again i did pick him up and i am going to start him this week when the commanders have not pressured the passer this year they've allowed a league high 19 touchdown passes yeah, and they're not going to be rushing the passer too often anymore. Okay, I love that. Um, I think now we go to the next tier. And the next tier, your quarterback eight overall, kicks off with C.J. Stroud. This is at the Cincinnati Bengals. We've talked about these high team totals so far, Hayden. Just 20 and a half, seven-point road underdogs here for C.J. Stroud going against mm -hmm. Uncle Lou and Arumo. That's the scary part, just to see what kind of change-ups Lou's going to have against C.J. Stroud. But honestly, like, C.J. Stroud just takes advantage over everybody. Like, he seems so poised out there. There's a reason why his interception rate is so low. I'm hoping that we can just ride this trend. You know, like, this is the most totally. important chart of the week. Last week, we finally had the neutral pass rate go to a league high, above average 61% passes, and it was exceptional out there. So I'm hoping that we can ride that. No Damian Pierce makes me hopeful that... 
this coaching staff that we like is going to let him cook out there. But we'll see if CJ Stroud as a rookie is ready for a defense that basically changes up their looks on almost every single play. Drop eight, pressure, simulated pressure, full-on blitz, sit back in zone, prevent, all that stuff. They'll mix it up a ton because they have a lot of continuity out there. Um, but even with all that, the Bengals are still 22nd against fantasy quarterbacks. Like Just because they shut down Josh Allen last week does not mean that this is some unit that's completely not able to, to stop quarterbacks as well, though. Love CJ. Love the placement that he has. Love how they're getting Nico Collins and Tank Dell open down the field. Love this mismatch offensive line that we spent so much time talking about this summer and the first half of this season. I mean, just seven pressures allowed last week with a 3.35 second time to throw. That is yeah. unbelievable stuff. Yeah. Um, I do want to mention that, and I think Matthew Barry put this out on his show on Peacock that like CJ Stroud is a locked in starter the rest of the way. Um, last week was CJ Stroud's first time inside of a top 10 quarterback for the entire mm -hmm. season, you know, and our buddy Rich Rebar pointed this out. No rookie quarterback has ever been a top 12 score against Lou and Rumo's defense. Yeah. Yeah. That's so why I, that's this why is going to be a out. really fun matchup with a super smart quarterback who has right. incredible placement with a play caller who is getting a ton of run this week, which I totally love, including here on this channel. And what do they do against Lou? And I'm with you that a big key in doing that is what they did in the second, third, and fourth quarters last week mm -hmm. of throwing the ball more often, especially on first downs. And that can bring them a lot of success. If CJ Stroud lights up this Bengals defense on the road, it is time to have top 10 locked in NFL quarterback status for CJ Stroud immediately as a rookie, which is basically impossible to do. But we've seen it with Justin Herbert recently. Um, but he, if he can do it again this week, that is special, special, special stuff. Definitely. Okay. I love this. I love when you get quarterbacks back in our lives and kyler murray is that as your quarterback nine this week he faced the atlanta falcons low total 28 and a half points they are underdogs by one and a half here at home uh talk to me what do you expect to see from uh, kyler murray in his return to the field i had the team total up at 21 points now oh. for arizona so that's that's why i'm having optimistic ranking the injury report he's completely off of it as well and like Every single time and every, every basically every report recently is like this team's trying to win. So it's been a full year since Kyler has torn his ACL. The Falcons defensive line takes a huge hit without Grady Jarrett. So I'm excited to see what Kyler Murray is going to look like in this offense. The Cardinals have been second lowest in neutral pass rate this season. I'm hoping they let Kyler Murray cook a little bit, especially if James Conner is going to miss. He seems very questionable to play here. So I, I like this coaching staff over there in Arizona, so I'm hoping that they can get the best out of Kyler Murray, even if he doesn't run the ball quite as much as he did. But it's not like they rushed him back in week one. He's only like eight months removed from this torn ACL. It's been yeah. at least a full season, so maybe he hits the ground running a little bit faster than other quarterbacks would. Rich Rebar over at Sharp Football Analysis and his worksheet pointed this out, and I thought this was one of the best stats I read this week. Arizona has been under center this year, 30.7% of their dropbacks this season. For his career, Kyler Murray has taken just 9% of his dropbacks right. under center. I don't necessarily attribute that to a Kyler thing, probably more of a Cliff Kingsbury thing. I know Drew Petzing also came out last week and mentioned that it wasn't a strength of Kyler's, but that doesn't mean that it isn't going to continue. Like I expect actually maybe that previous trend to switch on its head and Kyler to be asked to kind of fit into this offense a mm -hmm. bit. So I'm, I'm excited to see Kyler in a non horizontal ball offense that we saw with Cliff Kingsbury. Uh, and now in this at times quite creative offense that mm -hmm. we've seen under Drew Petzing as well. I'd also like to see Kyler Murray in the tush push, just see how tiny he is. <laughs> this is an offense that does it. Last year, on throws 20 or more yards down the field, Kyler only completed 24.5% of his passes. That was only ahead of Jimmy Garoppolo. Only ahead. So we've previously seen Kyler be a nice vertical thrower as well. So hopefully in this year, that has got ironed out as well. Mm -hmm. Trevor Lawrence up next. Trevor Lawrence against the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, they're at home. They're also underdogs. Just three top 12 scoring weeks for Trevor Lawrence on the season. And two of those were against the Indianapolis Colts. It's been 
kind of iffy for Lawrence. Like you mentioned, the neutral pass rates down to like league average. We've seen that a little bit higher. Historically. But I think it's I think it's iffy from a fantasy points angle, and not iffy from like an executing of an offense angle that mm-hmm. this team wants to have on the field. If that makes sense. And they've also missed a bunch of touchdowns very nearly and they are the worst team inside the red zone on a per play basis at least extending to negative plays so there are reasons for optimism the 49ers secondary is still missing some starters in my opinion they were active at the trade deadline but they uh, decided to go with chase young that's kind of the concern is this defensive line and just if this game gets a little bit slower pace than usual so the team total is at 21 and a half that's about league average, just a little bit more balanced than I thought Jacksonville was going to be in those Zay Jones out there, which means Calvin really is not allowed to, you know, run an easy route. Oh, and just to put a button on this, I, I think sometimes the lack of explosive plays can just be attributed to, again, a 2.41 second time to throw here. And again, I don't want to reiterate it every single show, but the lack of Zay Jones is meaning like so much Evan Ingram and Christian Kirk and quick throws in that department. But that's where 49ers also stop yep. plays. You know, like you're d- dealing with Fred Warner over the middle now. Yep. And despite that time to throw, and maybe this is associated to it, he's only been pressured on twenty on 29.6% of his dropbacks, the fourth lowest rate in the league. Um, so we'll see. I'm, I'm excited to see on the opposite and Chase Young too and like mm-hmm. what he can do with the 49ers who have resurrected so many defensive linemen and given them big contracts at other places yep. the following offseason. Brock Purdy in the same game is your next quarterback. Um, Five interceptions in the last three games. But to be honest, those interceptions from a fantasy angle have been the only negative parts of those games. Uh, And he has been amazing this season when not pressured. And the Jaguars are actually 25th in the league in terms of pressure rate. That was shocking to me because it seems like Josh Allen is always near the quarterback. I guess Trayvon Walker is doing absolutely nothing again. Um, We've talked about this before. Jacksonville's defense coordinator has openly admitted that they are trying to stop the run completely and daring teams to throw the ball. Obviously, that goes against what San Francisco wants to do. It sounds like they're going to be without Trent Williams, but they have their entire skill group back and ready to go. So I wouldn't be surprised if Brock Purdy throws the ball a couple more times per game, especially if Jacksonville can keep this one close. Um, And I'm with you with the turnovers. He should have been throwing turnovers consistently since he became became a starting quarterback he was running really hot avoiding them but shanahan over time just likes to dare the quarterbacks to throw the ball deep and over the middle that's where all the defensive players are so we should expect some turnovers but that doesn't mean that the yards and the big plays aren't going to be there i think that we should be okay if brock Purdy throws a couple turnovers because this offense is still number one in passing epa because they are taking these very valuable shots deep downfield do you want me to go to the next tier? I mean, this is 8, 9, 10, 11. Do I include the next quarterback here in this top tier? Are you sure? No, I'm not. <laughs> okay, <laughs> then we'll get a super flex category for your quarterback 12. That is Russell Wilson. <laughs> That's why I had to ask. You know, mm-hmm. this is why I had to ask. This is against the uh, Buffalo Bills. Um, 16 of 17 of Denver Broncos touchdowns this year have come through the air. That's the highest rate in the league. He's just been running super hot with touchdowns. The pass attempts and the yards have not been there for Russ. He's actually number one in touchdown rate all the way up at 7% as well. None of that will be sticky, but Buffalo's yards per pass attempt allowed has gone from 6.8 to 7.6 without Tredavious White. That's one of the higher marks in the entire league. They're still missing left uh, linebacker Matt Milano on top of it. So I think the Broncos are going to have to pass the ball more because we have Josh Allen as a quarterback one this week. We think they're going to score a bunch of points on this pretty bad Broncos defense. We know Sean Payton wants to be balanced. Will he actually be allowed to be balanced or could we have fourth quarter Russ chucking the ball downfield? And when he at least has the opportunity to do that, he has been fantasy viable at times. So I don't like Russell Wilson with the lead. I will take him as more than a touchdown favorite or underdog against a high-scoring offense. This is a pretty important second half of the season for Russell Wilson. Like, it can dictate or not whether they eat massive dead cap or do whatever to try to get rid of him this season after, you know, Sean Sean Payton goes into a second year in charge. Um, Or they stick with him heading into next year. Is that too much of a conclusion to make? 
Because I feel like at times we've been on the path to that this season. And other times Russell Wilson has played decently well, especially in like the opening 20 plays of a script. I think he's been somewhere around league average quarterback play, like given the circumstances of this season. So yeah, and they had a huge upset the last game. So I think they're going to try to keep themselves in the wild card mix here. Um, and yeah, I think the rest of the season will dictate that. They have huge decisions to make. Huge. Yeah. Okay. Your quarterback 13, Sam Howell at the Seattle Seahawks. I think Sam Howell, low key, has been one of the best fantasy performers mm -hmm. considering where he was drafted, if at all, and expectations heading into the season. Um, he has been the quarterback 13 or higher in seven of nine games this season. We know he's had 42, 52, and 45 pass attempts over the last three weeks. And now he's facing a Seattle Seahawks team who has allowed multiple passing touchdowns, though, in just one of their last five games. There's a lot to talk about with this version of the commander's offense because I actually mm -hmm. feel like in the last two weeks, it has changed a little bit versus what it was in the opening six to seven games. Number two in neutral pass rate. So abandon the run. Let Sam Howell cook out there. We'll see if Curtis Samuel, I think he was limited in practice, is back here. This is a tough matchup for me with Sam Howell. By the way, Sam Howell's lost two offensive line starters in the recent games as well. But for some reason, he's now avoiding sacks, which seems pretty crazy. I know the Seahawks just got lit up last week on defense, but a lot of that was on the ground. The pass defense, I still think, is going to be pretty good. They're down to 5.3 yards per pass attempt allowed with Jamal Williams or Jamal Adams on the field. They have Devin Witherspoon now in the starting lineup as well. So I think it's a lot of lot to ask for Sam Howell to go into Seattle against this defense that just added Leonard Williams and pass the ball at the rate that he does without taking sacks and turnovers and all that type of stuff. But I'm with you. He's so aggressive that and he scrambles a bit and he gets fired up out there. That's why he's been in the mix as a borderline quarterback, one option the entire season. Just to close the book on this Seattle defense, the only quarterback in this, again, according to Reeves, to finish higher than quarterback 17 on them over this season uh, was Joshua Dobbs as quarterback 12, who added 10 rushing points mm -hmm. to his uh, to his stat line in that game. Um, I will say, and I mentioned that, you know, this offense has changed a little bit. Sam Howell has now thrown the ball five or more yards down the field on just 54 and 49% of his passes over the last two games. So like they are being a bit quicker with everything mm -hmm. and that is helping him tremendously. And it coincides with, you know, everyone inside that building really liking him. So yep. I think there's gonna be some different people making decisions on that team next year. And you know, Sam Howell only had one start last year, so this is basically his rookie season. Gardner Minshew, of course, is the next quarterback on your list. This is against Bill, Steve, and Gerard Mayo. Uh, the Colts have scored 49 and a half more points than their implied team total this season. That is wow. the most in the league. And Hayden, their implied team total this week is still all the way up there at 22 mm -hmm. and a half points on the road. Right. So that's that's why I have them high. Just they're getting a lot of respect out there. They play fast. It doesn't seem like Josh Downs is going to play out there. So he's going to need to scramble a little bit, get to get huge games out of Michael Pittman. I think Kylan Granson is an interesting streamer in like two tight end leagues, if those even exist out there. But he just runs around a little bit. This team plays fast and they're well coached. And quite frankly, this Patriots just don't have enough guys. You know, it's as simple as that. They're just lacking talent. I still think that they can scheme them up really well. We've seen Minshew absolutely throw darts into linebackers uh, chess, but teams have just been able to take advantage of a down secondary down edge rush group uh, right now in New England. If you want to look at it from like a big picture perspective, Gardner Minshew has better numbers versus man coverage and the Patriots are running that at the fifth highest rate this season. Interesting. But no Josh Downs probably, right? That's right. what we're expecting. Heavy Michael Pittman game, hopefully. And maybe a sprinkle of our boy Isaiah McKenzie from back in the day. Maybe. Your boy. It's, I mean, it's I've not going to be, be an Alec Pierce week. Kylan Granson, get ready. Okay. I like that too. I like that too. Okay. Baker Mayfield. Against the Tennessee Titans. Top 12 score in three games in a row. Baker Mayfield is. Wow. But shockingly, and again, one who stressed shockingly, the Titans have not allowed multiple touchdown passes in a game since all the way back in week three. That seems fluky to me. They just traded <laughs> Kevin Byard. Uh, I don't like the corners. Um, yeah, th they haven't been as much of a pass funnel out there. I think that's because teams just don't think the Titans offense can really move the ball. But maybe Baker Mayfield and Will Levis can like just start checking balls 
deep downfield and see what happens. I think that Baker Mayfield has been fine enough. They're actually top 10 in passing EPA per play this season, which is shocking to me. And they've been passing the ball more and more uh, just because they still can't get the ground game going. I don't think they're going to try to get Rashad White against Jeffrey Simmons and these guys up front as well. So I just think based off of pass attempts uh, and matchup, I think that Baker Mayfield has been definitely worthy to be a super flex starter. Okay, next four names, Taylor Heineke, Kenny Pickett, Joshua Dobbs, and Mac Jones. I kind of feel like Joshua Dobbs might be a little underrated here. I know it's against the Saints defense, but we get rushing points from Joshua Dobbs in pure chaos. I mean, he had 66 yards, another rushing score this past week. Um, He's now rushed for a touchdown in three straight games, so this might be the cheap Konami code quarterback that we have this year in Josh Dobbs. I can see it. Um I and on top of that, just real quick, Trevor Lawrence and Tyson Bagent rushed for 59 and 70 yards against the Saints defense. Right. A lot of man coverage. I remember those Trevor Lawrence long run man coverage, bail the pocket and, and get up field. So certainly possible. I do think that Taylor Heineke can do that to some extent as well. And uh, we ranked Kyler Murray uh, and gave him a pretty decent projection. Drake London, he was limited on Wednesday. It seems like they're hoping and expecting him to be out there. If he is out there, that would be helpful because I don't think the Cardinals secondary is very good. Okay. Final five, Derek Carr, Will Levis. Oh my gosh. I got to pull this down. Deshaun Watson, Bryce Young, and Jordan Love. Anyone you want to hit on there? I uh, can't start Deshaun Watson. They have the second lowest team total of the week, only ahead of Tommy DeVito this week. <laughs> I'm not, I, I guess people are, are probably going to be somewhat excited to start Will Levis. I think this is going to be a roller coaster with Will Levis this season. Obviously, this is a pass funnel against Tampa Bay. We like to take our chances against them. So I guess maybe in theory, you can get him up a couple quarterback spots here just because he has some upside. I just think that there could be some pretty tough games just because he's so inexperienced. Yeah. Bucks defense allowed 73% completion rate and a league high 9.3 yards per pass attempt over the last four weeks. They've allowed nine touchdowns compared to one interception. I mean, Will Levis is going to spin it and flip it down the field. Um, but at some point, and maybe this is just me thinking it's possible, at some point, this defense and the secondary that is still being paid a bunch of money mm-hmm. um, and a head coach who has made his mark in this league as a defensive play caller for a very long time, to me, is going to write that at some point. And I also think that this Tampa Bay Buccaneers front is going to pressure Will Levis quite a bit in this game, just right. like he was against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Yep. Do you have okay. any takes about Thursday Night Football? Um, I mean, I might take the I might take the higher. I might take the over. Uh, it's on the game environment in, in general. Yeah, I mean the Panthers team totals at like seventeen and a half. That's not Correct. that's not very much. So I'm Correct. hoping that they can figure figure that out. I uh, just wanted to bring up one chart real quick, just or two charts. It's just aggressiveness. This is clean pockets. This is what I want to talk about. Just Bryce Young just throws the ball less downfield, and this is even with in clean pockets, average time to throw holds onto it, but still doesn't throw the ball. So I'm hoping just take a couple more chances here. That's all I'm asking for Bryce Young. I know it's the offensive line. I know it's the freaking wide receivers. I know it's yeah. the play call. Hold that back stuff. up because I think that he and Patrick Mahomes have something in common. Well, this does not include all of the jet sweeps, screens. But, but the next one does above it. I mean, yeah, but this has been like the worst Patrick Mahomes team as well. So it's, but I think they do have something in common where they have one 30 plus year old pass catcher right. that they funnel things over to in the middle of the field. And then no one that they can trust outside of that to get down the field. Um, I think that this is and that's the only that thing they, they have in common. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I just think that they have a, a shared problem. And uh, trust me, I would love for this Panthers passing offense to be more explosive. Right. Um, don't take my word for it. You can look at times when there's holding on to the football 3.3 seconds, and then the wide receivers are just 20 yards down the field right. and are right. just getting into their right. breaks. It's a problem. It's rough. Take some chances, though. It's rough. Okay, let's do to the uh, tight end position because it's actually one we definitely want to talk about now. Hell yeah. I mean, it has been restored. It has been resurrected. Tight ends are good again. And that kicks us off with Mark Andrews as the tight end one. Is there anything you want to say about his, even though he is a locked and loaded player, Hayden? Well, the Browns are absolutely outrageous against fantasy tight ends. That said, Mark Andrews back in week four had five receptions, 80 yards, two touchdowns, 26% target share. So 
by default, just got to give him the credit to be the tight end one uh, overall. But I think the next group of players is about as strong as I can remember it being. Let's do that. Two through six, Don Kincaid, Sam Laporta, TJ Hawkinson, Taysom Hill, and Dalton Schultz. There's your tight ends two through six. They're all getting a bunch of good volume now, sometimes in rushing production for one of these guys. Uh, they all are living over the middle of the field at times. And I mean, they are just really incorporated and important pieces into their passing offenses. And I love it. Dalton Kincaid, obviously the Bills project for the most points. He's been the tight end four in usage this month, averaging 12 expected fantasy points per game without Dawson Knox. That's really, really strong stuff. And the Broncos will be getting lit up by tight ends. Sam Laporta, uh, I do think that there could be some on-off splits with David Montgomery just because some of the red zone uh, usage will go David Montgomery's way, but the Chargers have allowed four different tight ends to catch six-plus passes this season. We talked about the team total being really high there, and then TJ Hawkinson dealing with a rib injury, assuming that he is healthy. I do think that there is something to Josh Dobbs targeting these tight, tight ends all the time here. That said, the Saints have allowed just 3.7 receptions per wow. game this season, but Cole Kmet somehow, don't know how, scored two touchdowns on him last week. It was actually because of design stuff. Well, yeah, and, and they were covered too. So right. like they were difficult grabs. You know, we talked mm -hmm. about that leak pattern that was really well covered and typically it's wide ass open. Yep. And then he did have that block, 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 shed you at the line of scrimmage, then catch it. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I'm excited to get Sam Laporta back here. And then Don Kincaid, I know that I mean, we get stuff the last two weeks and it's almost two different game environments from them where one was super quick passes and then we went back to even Josh Allen being confused. And in both of those, Don Kincaid without Dawson Knox is out there all the time right. and featured in both. And so I think that answers some questions for us. He's going to be such a stud. Um, I think Taysom Hill is the most interesting here just because he's been the number one in points and usage over the last month. He's basically the red zone wildcat quarterback. We'll get a couple of carries on top of it. My question to you is this Minnesota defense is so interesting and so unique. Will they trust Taysom Hill to kind of be the quarterback against a defense that shows so many players at the line of scrimmage? We've seen teams against Minnesota mm. not run the ball as much. So I wonder if like, we're not going to see as much Taysom Hill this game. I or am I just reading into this a little bit too much here? I mean, to me, the Saints are have been unbelievable in terms of their red zone possessions. I mean, they've had 14 red zone possessions over the last three weeks. That's the yeah. second most in the NFL. And so that is probably where Taysom Hill is going to get his money here. I don't think that we're going to get that same slot wide receiver tight end usage that we got three or four weeks ago when Jawan Johnson mm -hmm. was missing and all that stuff. So the foundation for Taysom Hill's game, I, I like what you're saying where they – muddy every single gap and so can you really do wildcat stuff off of that or you right. want to run more of your normal offense but again at the end of the day i think either a trick play where we've seen from Taysom hill throwing a touchdown or red zone slash inside the 10 yard line rushing is mm -hmm. still the pathway for you know a top five to seven week like we've gotten recently with Taysom. Yep. tons of it uh last note dalton schultz Bengals have allowed the second most fantasy points to tight ends this week we're expecting them to be in garbage time mode, C.J. Stroud's throwing the ball over the middle of the field more than any quarterback in the league. That's where I think tight ends like to be. So Dalton Schultz has been very legit. Over the last month, tight end five. Adjust. Evan Ingram, George Kittle, Jake Ferguson are the next three tight ends here. Um, George Kittle, they welcome Debo Samuel back for this game. So that doesn't give us a read on which one of these four guys and one of them is going to miss out on production this week. And typically that kind of has been George Kittle outside of that one explosive week. I'm kind of surprised that you don't have the Ferg daddy higher than this. I wanted to move him higher as well, but I think like court or tight end to me, three to Ferg daddy are very similar to me. I think Dalton Kincaid, you can maybe even put into his own tier. We don't have to do that for the show, but, uh, the Ferg daddy to me looks really damn good yeah. here. Cowboys are projected for a bunch of points, but uh, like you said, it's just how much actual volume are we going to get out of this offense? Um, but I think it's real. I think like long-term Jake Ferguson does belong in the tight end one conversation. And then for Evan Ingram, doesn't seem like Zay Jones is going to be back here. I do worry about Fred Warner against him because a lot of the plays have been kind of designed looks over the middle for Evan Ingram. Are you going to be designing plays against him? 
And then, like you said, with George Kittle, he's averaged five expected fancy points when Ayuk and Debo have been in the lineup. When just one of them have been out there, it's at 9.8. It's almost double the amount of usage George Kittle gets. Obviously, uh, they're all healthy except left tackle Trent Williams. So we'll see. It's just a little bit harder for George Kittle to get there. Obviously, he deserves a boom week every once in a while too, though. Trey McBride now attached to Kyler Murray, which could be really good things. We've seen Zach Ertz have great experiences attached to Kyler Murray. Logan Thomas, not a surprise here as Titan 11, but kind of mentioned <laughs> among all of these younger, explosive pass catchers with David right. Njoku and Kyle Pitts next to him. So he's the old man of the group. So starting with Trey McBride, do you know what his target share is over the last two weeks? Um, you know me and my infatuation with target share. I'm going to put it at uh, 28%. 34%. That go. is unheard of. So if you're going to copy paste those stats and throw it down with Kyler as your quarterback, you can see how things can get real spicy with Trey McBride. He's a little bit better after the catch this year than he was last year. Logan Thomas, like you said, uh, this is only because they are projected underdogs against Seattle. In the four games, Logan Thomas has played when the commanders have lost. He has averaged 5.5 catches for 55 yards on seven targets. That That's basically tight end one numbers here. Um, so we can't fully expect that to happen, but that is a trend because he sits there underneath. You said that they're throwing the ball underneath more often recently. That also helps Logan Thomas. David Njoku, they've been dialing up more screens for him. He's way more involved recently. Love that for him, except Baltimore has allowed under 34 yards per game to tight ends. Don't love that. And then I'm not sure if you have a good Kyle Pitts note. Well, I actually do. Um, if I'm translating this correctly from JJ Zacharyson's podcast, I believe he noted that in each of the last two weeks, Taylor Heineke's average or intended air yards per attempt is higher than one we've gotten for Desmond Ritter all season. Okay, um, I know that John Smith has gotten there with, you know, a long touchdown and all that stuff. So, but we know where Kyle Pitts is being featured in this offense and it's intermediate and down the field, never underneath. So if Taylor Heineke, who dating back to his Washington days, thinks he has one of the strongest arms in the NFL and loves to throw it down the field, maybe that yeah. does line up here with Kyle Pitts a little bit. Yeah, I agree. I, I still think Kyle Pitts is like a borderline tight end one option. Like, I think this is a very flat tier and there's so many of them. And I, I even think like Cole Komet tonight, I mean, he's been on fire recently. Um, I don't trust Tyson Bajent. Um, Carolina somehow is allowing the second fewest receiving yards to tight ends. But I think that's just because they've been so bad against receivers and running backs. Um, he's been more or less a focal point too. So this is just like a really deep tier of tight ends. I agree. Okay. To close this out, Cole Komet, Hunter Henry, John U. Smith, the Falcons tight end one. Yep. Kate Otten, Kylan Granson, Luke Musgrave, and Gerald Everett. Hunter Henry last week had his highest expected points of the season that is with Kendrick Bourne sidelined here as well. Indianapolis has been ninth worst against fantasy tight end. So I think that he's a fine streamer. If you're in a really deep league, like you said, Johnny Smith, a tight end one over there, uh, big play on that screen. And then Kate on has been popping up Kylan Granson without the Josh downs. He deserves a mention Luke Musgrave and Gerald Everett um, are rounding this thing out. And then you get to like the touchdown or bust here. But I mean, that's a that is as good of a tight end grouping totally. that I can possibly remember. Yeah, I'm this is just another example of how freaking long the fantasy football season is where in the first 6 weeks it felt like we had never had a lower scoring season for the tight end position in general and then over the last 4 weeks um many of these players have been unbelievable. Right. I think when we do our sit start show sometimes we kind of like just pretend that the tight ends don't belong in the flex conversation. Right. I do, do think like Jake Ferguson versus some of the wide receivers that people are going to be oh. asking us about. Like, I do think that this is okay to start multiple tight ends in deeper league with bye weeks all stuff. And by the way, Travis Kelsey's not even on this list, you know, like, right. I'm with you. Okay. Uh, sickos. You want to pull it up? Yes. While he's doing that people, um, hit that subscribe button. Do it. You've made it 44 minutes. We appreciate you tuning in. Um, and we, as I mentioned, We'll still have a sit start show on Sunday morning. It'll probably be another sprint because there's another game in Germany this week, um, but we'll be there. So get your questions ready. And we love those, the community questions and uh, music takes and sound takes that we give you are uh, tons of fun on top of that. Gosh, I went to a Doja Cat concert. I know you don't like music, but it was a hell of a show uh, this week. Oh maybe <laughs> the most ridiculous sicko defense of all time. Yeah. I mean, 
the Cowboys against the Giants, like they're gonna they're gonna outscore. Put them in your super flex if you can. It's gonna be outrageous stuff for them. Assuming that they are not available, let's just remove them. Uh, we have the Ravens are good. The Raiders, by the way, last week the Raiders were the number one sicko defense of the week, and they definitely paid that off. We can go back to them. Tampa Bay, uh, Seattle against Sam Howell. Hope to get some turnovers. Uh, maybe Buffalo against Russell Wilson, but don't really love that one as much. I think that Tampa Bay and the Raiders would be my, my top options this week. Prove him wrong, Tommy DeVito. Prove him wrong. All right. That is outrageous. <laughs> <laughs> it is so I mean, what would you put the odds at a defensive touchdown or special teams touchdown? Well, Turpin is a freaking animal out there too. The, That's what I mean. Turner. Um, I don't know. Like, it's got to be like 30, 40 percent, which is I like mean, that crazy. that is insanely high. Thirty three percent, like yeah. a third of a chance that they, you know, will score a defensive touchdown. That's pretty unbelievable. Yeah, pretty unbelievable. All right, that's gonna do it. Thank you, producer Weaves, as always, for making us look nicer and cleaner and all that good stuff. Thank you to all of you for being part of this community, hitting that subscribe button. Uh, and Hayden and I will talk to you soon. Up the fella. See ya.